So I think with that, let's get rolling. We're at 205, and if some more folks make it in here, uh, that's totally cool. But we'll we'll get going because uh, we definitely slotted this for an hour. I think we can go over if we want, but we definitely want to be respectful of your time. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. That's all I can say. You've just made everybody's month here. Like the the uh, response from the ACF community to show up for this event is just fantastic. And like, I'm so hyped. Everybody's so hyped to share what we've got to share with you today. Um, and so the, the talk that I'm going to give today is called Building Your First Headless WordPress Project with ACF and WP GraphQL. Um, so before we get started, just want to call out a couple of etiquette things that I'd like to talk about. We obviously have a ton of people in here. We're pushing 600 now. Hopefully, you know, we get a couple hundred more in as people trickle. Um, but please just be excellent to one another. Like the chat's rolling and I love to see that. Um, but keep it clean. This is being recorded. Um, the, the chat transcripts will also live on in infamy. So don't say anything in there that you don't want recorded publicly. Last, we have a ton of people in here also, and I envisioned us doing some live coding demos for about 50 people, which has been our typical attendance at these webinars. So we're at least uh, 12x that right now. And so be kind to the shared demo resources. I've got some endpoints up there so people can learn. Um, we're here to, so that people can learn. So if you could use the queries that I've already written so that we can benefit from some caching. Um, and if you're a smarty pants and you can like write your own queries on your own, definitely feel free to like open up your own WordPress instance and, and code against that. Um, so I'll give a quick introduction uh, to myself. I'm Jeff Everhart, a developer advocate at WP Engine, focused on uh, headless WordPress, all things headless WordPress. So I've been using WordPress uh, as a site builder since about 2007, and that really got me started into coding. And I've been dabbling in code with that and uh, have been working at, professionally as a developer, both in, in the WordPress space and in other spaces since about 2015, 2016. If you're interested in following me on any of the stuff, you know, there's my Twitter handle down in the bottom. You can also check out uh, a little bit of the content that I create on the side on my website. So let's first talk about our goals for today. So Headless WordPress is definitely, it's something that's been around for a couple of years, but it's definitely gaining momentum and traction in the community. So one of our largest goals is to explain what Headless WordPress is and why people use it. Uh, beyond that, we're going to look at ACF data and how we can use that with both REST and WP GraphQL APIs. And then we're going to jump into some live coding examples where we're going to modify an existing React SPA, meaning single page application, to consume WordPress data. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at some of the different frameworks that you can use, and like some hosting op options for this style of project. Um, so, and definitely participate in these polls. We're going to use this data to help us sort of guide our content creation on the developer relations team. So all that stuff is super valuable for us. Um, what we can't do today. So this is obviously a large group. Yep, we beat 600. Rock on, y'all. So what we can't do today, we can't deep dive into React or JavaScript fundamentals. Um, I, I'm a bang up JavaScript dev but React is not my favorite choice, so I may not even be the person you would want teaching you some of those details anyway. Um, but for what we're gonna do today, I will be a perfectly fine guide for you. Um, so beyond that, we can't explain the basics of WordPress or ACF. I, I gather that most of you actually got here because you were on the ACF mailing list. So uh, we're gonna kind of proceed with the assumption that most of that stuff, you sort of already know how it works. You know what the different ACF content types um, are and, and you can use that part of WordPress and ACF. And also we can't troubleshoot as we go for any specific problem. Like if there's, you know, I've, I've tried to make the resources that we're using as resilient as possible, but I can't really stop. So if you got a question, throw it in the chat. Um, I got some people here on, on the panel who can kind of help me maybe look at some of those questions in real time. But we'll also have some time at the end um, and we'll give you some ways that you can follow up with us to learn more later. Um, so first of all, I like to start off by answering this question like what is headless wordpress because i think there are a lot of misconceptions about what it is what it has to be um, and so i'm a big fan of using extended metaphors as a part of the learning and teaching process so i like to liken headless wordpress to the way that we build a house right headless wordpress is an architectural pattern and not a set of specific technologies right so there's no requirement that you have to use wp craftql there's no requirement that you have to use next.js you know in fact we were talking 
you know, a while ago about some of the early headless WordPress experiences being built around the XML RPC API. So, right, just this idea of using WordPress as an API. And I liken this to building a house because, right, if we look at how houses or homes are constructed all over the world, there's lots of different construction techniques. You know, here in the United States, we use wood, wood framing, but maybe you've got masonry or maybe you've got steel frame structures, right? And you, you can have all sorts of exteriors, all sorts of architectural uh, affordances built into these. So both structurally and aesthetically, there's a wide variety of things that these, you know, do this, this, that this digital real estate can be. And that's the same with headless WordPress. It gives us as developers a lot of flexibility in determining how we want to approach building a particular piece of digital real estate. So I, I include these two architectural diagrams because I think they're important to talk through when we're comparing traditional WordPress to headless WordPress. And so these are the only two architectural diagrams I'm gonna show you today, um, but I think they're really illustrative, right? And so if we start over here on the right in this traditional WordPress scenario with our visitor, when they visit site.page and they type that into a URL browser bar, you know, maybe they hit a CDN, but eventually that request gets forwarded back onto WordPress, right? WordPress looks at that URI, tries to determine what type of content it is, and then resolves back to a particular template in our PHP themes, right? Said, so, oh, this is a page with this, so I'm gonna give them page.php. Or maybe I've got, it's a post, and I've got a specific uh, post type template out there, and I'm gonna use that. So their whole interaction is through this WordPress core mechanism, right? But this that's the same with the publisher. The publishers, all of their interactions are gonna be through WordPress as well, right? When they're writing content, they're using the block editor, they're adding advanced custom fields uh, to structure data. All of that's done through WordPress core. The same with the interactions that the developer has, right? If I need want to change the look or feel of my website, like I either need to add in some additional CSS or maybe I can, uh, you know, like I need to add some theme templates or if I want to enqueue JavaScript in a certain way, I've got to determine, does that go in a plugin or should I include this in my theme and enqueue my scripts and figure out how all of that stuff works together, right? So any of the code that's going to get shipped to the browser has to go through uh, this WordPress core mechanism. Um, so if we compare that to headless WordPress, for example, we can see that this architectural uh, diagram is just a little bit more complex. And so I like to call that out uh, right at the get-go get because I think it's important to really, really say, yeah, this, this is a little bit more complex. And now there are benefits that that complexity can give us, um, but it is a little bit more complex. So let's run through this diagram and see what that looks like. So if we start over here on the right-hand side with our visitor, right, they type in site.com slash page, and maybe it hits a CDN. But instead of getting forwarded on directly to WordPress, this actually gets handled by, in this diagram, a node.js runtime, right? And so it's important to call out that this section of the diagram is actually really flexible. It doesn't necessarily need to be node.js. Uh, if you host on our Atlas platform, you get a node container, and so it is a Node.js runtime. But this client is really flexible, and we're watching people experiment with different types of clients in real time with Headless WordPress, right? So instead of building a web app, maybe they want this to be an iOS or an Android app using React Native that talks to WordPress through the API. We're also watching some innovative people do stuff with Internet of Things, kiosks, and you know, building really cool in-person experiences that are powered by WordPress through this API-driven pattern. But so once this client, this Node.js runtime gets the request, it then determines, okay, what is it that they're asking for and what data do I need to get from WordPress? So it makes the determination there and says, okay, well, I need to get the post one third with the idea of 137 from the WordPress API. So it makes a request out to WordPress either through GraphQL or the REST API, and then it gets shipped back down to that client. And then the client decides how to render this application. So the publisher's interaction with WordPress doesn't change. And I think it's important to take headless WordPress in the context of where other headless CMSs are going. And so we're seeing a lot of movement from you know, things like WordPress, Drupal, towards headless first CMSs like Contentful, Sanity, Strappy, and I think uh, I always get this one, Story Block, uh, I believe, right? But what we're hearing from publishers and the content marketers and the people who are actually writing the content is that WordPress actually has the best publishing experience. So what we're trying to do is enable these headless patterns in a framework that the publisher is already comfortable with. And the benefits that this brings the developer is a lot more flexibility in how they approach those development practices, right? I can now pick and choose what I want my client to be. Do I wanna use Spell, which I saw in the chat? Do I wanna use Next? 
Do I want to use a React Spa? Do I want to make this an iOS client? That's entirely up to you. And then all of really the code that you ship for those uh, particular use cases doesn't necessarily need to be filtered through this WordPress core mechanism. We can just ship it directly. And at that point, WordPress really becomes this CMS repository where people publish content and then an API through which we get that data into our other applications. So given the additional complexity, what are some of the benefits of headless WordPress? And so I couch these as benefits, but it's also important to realize that none of this stuff is like exclusive to headless WordPress. And so you can definitely do a lot of this in traditional WordPress. It might just be in some cases more difficult or uh, through different means. So one of the reasons that a lot of people tend to opt into headless is the idea of increasing site speed and core web vitals, right? If we think back to that traditional WordPress, and if you've been around the WordPress space long enough, everybody's seen a site that's just become bloated with like theme code, plugins, maybe page builders, all of this stuff that just adds page weight and ends up with this really poor user experience. And so Headless sort of flips that on, on its head, no pun intended, uh, because really at that point, once we're developing a separate JavaScript application, for example, we really get total control over whatever gets sent to the browser and how the users interact with those things after they're in the browser. So it's something like Next, which takes advantage of something like link prefetching, where it loads the data in the background before a user clicks on it, we can, we can create these really cool experiences. Um, increased security is something that we hear talked about a lot, because once you sort of take WordPress out of the forefront of your web architecture uh, and really relegate it to being the CMS API, uh, it just decreases the surface area with which attackers can try and hack you. Um, and also, I think a lot of those security uh, issues that people cite about WordPress whether those are valid or not come from that plugin bloat. And with Headless, you just tend to use fewer plugins out of the box because you're creating your experiences or your front end customizations in a different way. Um, and so, so that, that is eliminated to some degree as well. Another thing that we hear from developers in particular is the idea that Headless has a better developer experience. And you can even see this in the Jamstack survey results where WordPress like, is still the largest CMS but it has the lower, lowest developer satisfaction score. Uh, where headless WordPress, you know, is not as large, but people are much happier, developers in particular are much happier using it. And because we're focused on shipping these JavaScript apps, we get to take advantage of some of like, you know, the developer workflows that something like a Vercel or Netlify or JavaScript based hosting environment provides for you. Um, one of the other things we hear from large organizations or agencies who are working with large organizations is that this really supports component-based development, right? In most JavaScript frameworks, that component is like the smallest unit of code that you're going to work on. It really lends itself towards working in like an atomic design practice. Uh, and so we find it, people find it easier to implement component-based websites uh, in, this, in this paradigm than they, than they do in the old sort of template-based development system. Um, and the last thing it allows us to do, because essentially what we're doing here is we're turning WordPress into an API, is that we can write once, publish everywhere, right? So if we have a data source, it can supply data to our website. It could supply data to an I iOS um, or Android application or Internet of Things device. Um, and so I'm, and I'm, I'm just going to close the chat. I'm trying to keep up, but I don't, I don't think that's a great idea with as much as going on there. But I'm glad to see everybody having great, great mm -hmm. discussion. Um, so what are we building today? So today in our workshop, we're going to look at a React spa that was built sort of using create React app. And what's going to happen here is that our server is basically going to send an index.html file and a JavaScript bundle. And then all of the routing and data fetching is going to happen inside of the browser. So on the WordPress end, uh, the server is going to provide data over a GraphQL endpoint. And then uh, WP GraphQL and WP GraphQL Smart Cache are two plugins that I have installed to make that happen. I've all obviously got ACF Pro turned on. And then to make those two plugins work together, there's actually an extension that we add called WP GraphQL for ACF. And that allows your ACF data to become discoverable inside of your GraphQL scheme. Um, so cool. So what does our backend look like? Um, and so I'm going to, I've got one more slide and then we'll hop out and sort of take a tour of, um, the WordPress website. So what does our backend look like? Most of the people who are developing backends for headless WordPress, you know, choose one of two options. Like I said, XML RPC, technically you could do a headless WordPress site in that. I'm not sure anybody would or would want to now, um, but you could. Just a couple 
it's technically headless. Um, but so most people either choose between the REST API or GraphQL using WP GraphQL. So REST architecture focuses on creating an endpoint for each resource, right? We've got an endpoint for posts, an endpoint for categories, an endpoint for authors. And sometimes this means multiple round trips to get all of the data we need if we're querying across collections. Also, a couple, I'll show a couple of examples of how we can sort of cheat that a little bit. Um, but, you know, say, say we wanted to do something really specific, like I want to get a post and then I want to look at what category it's in and then get, you know, the 10 most recent posts in that category to display uh, down at the bottom as a related post thing. That's not really something you could do very easily with REST. You'd have to make multiple requests to make that happen. Now, on the other hand, GraphQL is a declarative query language, and this turns the WordPress database into a graph via WP GraphQL. And so typically there's one GraphQL endpoint that accepts these formatted queries and that returns data from across the graphs. So really you can specify anything you want in here. Um, but again, you've got to format this query and we've got to set up so that there's only one endpoint, right? There's slash GraphQL that accepts the query, processes your, your query and returns you the data. So two different approaches that we'll, we'll deep dive into here for a second. Um, and let me exit full screen real quick and then we'll hop into our next slide. And so, yep, I'm going to go ahead and copy this URL and dump it into the chat. So we're going to be running uh, most of this stuff today out of this um, GitHub repository. And somebody just said, I use the REST API a lot, but not inside a headless WP. Yep. And I, I like to call things partially headless, where like you have, you know, you're using mostly API driven practices, but maybe still parts of WordPress core to serve that. And that's a great stepping stone to something that's fully decoupled. Um, and so I'll go ahead and open up this GitHub repo in another tab. And if you scroll down here, do me a favor, try not to click around on all these links right now, but I've got a couple of uh, URLs that are available for you all to play around with. Like here's this demo site uh, to the REST API demo site for GraphQL. And then I got, I got us a backup GraphQL endpoint. We've got a lot of people in here. We're pushing 700 people now. So we're really going to be fire testing some of this. I'm going to say that this ACF headless.wp engine one is actually like the smallest shared instance running GraphQL smart cache. So we're going to see really like how much traffic this stuff can handle. And I think that's fantastic that we're doing some live, some like live fire testing. But if something Jeff, can fails, you, uh, drop that link. Oh yeah. Did I not put it in the chat? Somebody's got me. Thank you, Scott. I'll pop it in there one more time. Yep. Cool. And let me know if you need it again, uh, but thanks to and folks, if you could drop it in there and, and be, be good community members, that would help because the chat is rolling. Um, okay, so now we're going to hop over and I'm going to take a tour through our WordPress dashboard um, and just look at a couple of things. So I mentioned a couple of the plugins that we've got installed already, um, but for, for requirements, base level requirements for this demo, like it's WP GraphQL, I've got ACF Pro turned on, and then this WP GraphQL for advanced custom fields thing. Um, all right, so let's take a look real quick at our custom field setup for this, for this particular site that we're going to be working with. Um, so I modeled the data here really after just like some basic post resources, right? I've got my field group here called post resources. Um, and then I've got two fields in it that are using repeater fields. So I've got blog posts, um, gave it a label, you know, a field name, and then it's got two subfields, the title and URL for those resource posts. And same with videos that looks very similar, right? We've got videos. And then down here, we've got two subfields, uh, title and URL. And so if you are working with the REST API um, and you want to expose the ACF data over the REST API, there's really only one button that we should need to click. We open up this group setting option and then click show and REST API and ACF will handle the rest. Um, with WP GraphQL, um, that extension is going to add this whole different menu down here where we can select you know, whether we want to include this whole field group in there, and then we even can give it a field name. And a bunch of this stuff down here with the typing is a little bit more advanced. And so it would let you uh, specify some, some GraphQL types for the field group if they didn't match up nicely with something that you had already. Um, okay, and I see, awesome, Jason's in there answering questions about GraphQL smart cache. So very cool, yep. And ACF did get a new skin. It is pretty, pretty fancy. So cool, all right, so that's how you would enable these things, but how do we actually use that data? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open up this sort of separate uh, program called HTTPy, uh, which is a, uh, you know, like a data client that I use to explore REST APIs. So I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of different scenarios, right? And so if I wanna get a collection of my posts, I can hit that posts endpoint and click send, uh, and I get back all this data 
Um, and if we come down here, you know, we should get back like 10 posts, I think by default. Um, and if we scroll down and actually start looking through, you'll see that we get this ACF uh, property added. And this contains, you know, blog posts, which is an array of objects with title and URL, right? Exactly what we would sort of expect from our repeater field and video looks the same. Um, and so this is, you know, like a good thing where we're going to query and say, get me the, you know, the 10 most recent posts. And you could add like a per page query string here if you wanted more. Um, but we can also actually just pass in slugs, right? So if we wanted to query this by a particular slug and say, get our artisan air plant chicharrones post, uh, we can click send. And then that's just going to bring us back that individual post. But you can see here that, hey, this is a ton of data. Um, and sometimes that may not be great. And if we look more specifically at the data, like right at categories, instead of returning the actual category, we're just getting the IDs. So that's not super helpful for us to construct a user interface, sort of highlight some of the limitations of the REST API. Now there's a little trick that we can do to add that data in using this embed query string parameter. And what that's gonna do is certain resources are what's called linkable in the REST API, meaning that if they're in that resource, I can link them in and embed them. So if you want like featured media, the author, categories or terms, you can you can do that by adding on this additional query parameter. So if we do this and just close out a, a chunk of this stuff and scroll on down, we'll close out ACF. We can see there that these are the links, right? And they say like author, collection, uh, stuff like that. Let's close that out. But we get this underscore embedded property. So here we've got data about the author, uh, you know, data about the featured media, which is, you know, your, your featured featured image posts and categories and so on and so forth. Um, but again, that's a lot of data. And so there are ways that we can sort of solve that problem, which is something that GraphQL talks about solving, right? Is the idea of overfetching. We don't want more data than we need. So if we want, we can use this underscore fields query parameter to specify just the fields that we want back from the REST API. So here I'm saying, I want the post with the ID of 22, but I want just the title, content, date, slug, and all the ACF stuff. And I get that, that back and that looks way more manageable. Um, and then we can actually combine the two, right? So we could say like, here are the fields I want, and I want you to embed these specific things. But this is at the point where for me, the querying starts to get a little bit gnarly and where WP GraphQL kind of steps in and solves this problem in a more elegant way, right? So here we're telling it just what we want and adding a couple of extra embedded things. Um, but so let's pop back into our WordPress dashboard and I'll sort of show you what's up with uh, WP GraphQL. So like I said, that's just one endpoint. And instead of it being uh, like an HTTP API, this is a query language in itself. So if I, um, yeah, we're gonna leave in here and that's fine. We don't need to save any of these changes. So if I open up, once I install WP GraphQL, I get this uh, GraphQL option over here and I can open up what's called the GraphQL IDE, GraphQL. And what this gives me is like a real time place that I can experiment with my queries and test them you know, using real live data and then copy them into my application as you'll kind of see here in a minute. But I can also explore using this thing called the query composer, right? So if we wanted to see how we get ACF data in this, um, you know, we're gonna go ahead and click open the posts uh, content type. Then we're gonna dig down into nodes. And then in here, I just really wanna get the title. So I'm gonna leave this fairly open. So I really just wanna get the title. Um, and then we can see that I also have this post resources uh, property on here as well, right? That corresponds to that ACF data. So if I open this up, you can see I've got blog posts and I can select title and URL. And then I can also come down here and go to videos and select title and URL as well. So I get all this stuff back. And then if I click run, it's actually gonna run that query against my live data and give it, give it back to me. So this is really useful in constructing your queries at, at the start of a project. And then I also use it a lot if I'm developing and like I need to modify a query. And obviously like navigating JSON can be difficult, right? And so like I always come back here and say, okay, well, I need to go post.nodes, you know, and then that's an array. And then it, it just helps me navigate that data a little bit easier. Um, but all right, so that sort of gives you an overview kind of of, of both options. Um, and awesome, I see some really, really good, uh, really good, really good chat going on in there. So very, very cool. Um, so we're gonna pop back out. Now we're gonna switch gears just a little bit. Um, and so I'm gonna go back to our GitHub repo. And so now let's move into uh, our sort of live coding demo and look at getting this spa wired up. So there are a couple of ways that you could approach this. 
Um, one, go ahead, feel free to fork this repository. Uh, it'll be useful for you later if you're interested in seeing what deployment of this looks like. Um, but you can either clone this repository, fork it, or I've also got uh, this whole project set up in a code sandbox. And that's actually what I'm going to be doing. So I'm going to open this code sandbox link in a new tab. And it's my recommendation that if you do this, once it renders, uh, you actually go ahead and fork it. And that way, uh, you can always come back to the start project, right? You don't, it, it won't overwrite the starting point for this. Um, and again, I think yours, this should populate with uh, the right URL for you to use. Uh, so you should kind of be good to go there. Um, and if not, you can always get it back at the repo, right? I've got those GraphQL APIs down there. I'm going to be using a different one just so that if you all uh, crash the server, I can keep on rolling. But so let's take a look at what this looks like, right? So I mentioned that this was going to be a React Spa. We've got this nice blog index page, and we can click around from the tiled gallery into these different posts. So right now, each one of those things is, you know, displaying the same post details. And so this is what we're going to spend, you know, the next couple of minutes making dynamic. Um, so let's, let's get started with that. And we can, we can also sort of dig into the code just a little bit, because I mentioned this was a spa. So really all of this starts with this index.html file, right? This is what gets shipped to the browser along with the JavaScript bundle. And you see this div ID with root down here. And basically what happens is React's going to hook into that particular div and then render our entire application inside of that. And then any routing that's going to happen is going to happen in this app.js file. So here we're pulling in these route and switch components from React Router that we're using to match these paths in the browser window, right? So when, when, we, when we hit this index one, we render the home page. If we put in a, a route that matches this, you know, blog dash colon slug, which is called a dynamic route segment, um, we're going to render this post, this post page, right? And pass in some dynamic data here. So the next couple of steps are going to be us actually configuring these, this thing to pull from our WordPress server. Um, and to do this, can you use Next.js at this point for all the SSG stuff? You, you can, yes. And there's tons of tutorials out there for that. We're, and so that's a good call out. Yes, we're not using Next. We're making a React spa because that's going to be important later when we try to deploy this thing. Um, so awesome. So what we'll do first is I'm going to just copy some code off screen and sort of bring that into our project. Uh, the first thing that we're going to want to do to get started data fetching is create a new directory called lib. So this is just going to be a generic directory. And then inside of this directory, we're going to create an Apollo.js file. If you worked with React before, you should be familiar with uh, something called Apollo Client. It's a really popular data fetching library for GraphQL. And there's a lot of niceties about it that I'll sort of explain as we go. Um, so here we're just importing a number of different resources from Apollo Client. Um, and I'm not going to dive too deep into what's happening here. But this code is just a little bit of extra configuration that we've added to make this work really well with WP GraphQL Smart Cache. Um, so we're using get for queries instead of posts. Um, and then the, the idea of this HTTP link is really helpful if you're doing more advanced stuff with GraphQL. And so that's, if you're interested, read about that. Um, but I'm not going to dive too deep into that. Suffice it to say, we're really just passing, passing this, uh, you know, URL into our code here. And I'm going to swap mine out for my demo site. Um, all right. Make sure I don't have an extra forward slash. And then right below that, I'm going to declare a new variable called client. And I'm going to set that equal to a new Apollo client instance. And as the first argument in here, right, I'm going to pass this link that resolves to this URL. The second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new cache, and that's going to be set to a new in-memory cache. And we'll, I'll actually show you this in practice once we have everything wired up. But it's a great idea, uh, especially for spas, because, you know, e with a spa, and we're, if we're not doing SSG like with Next, you have the potential to make a lot of requests of your API. And maybe you don't want that because the data is not changing or it's already cached on the network level like a lot of REST API requests are. Um, so it doesn't really benefit you. Uh, so what this in-memory cache does is Apollo is smart enough to realize, hey, we already made this query and got a response. I'm just going to use this data instead of going out to the actual API and doing anything. So I'm going to save that file. Um, and then the next step that we're going to do is we're going to actually use something called the Apollo provider to make that available to our application. So I'm going to open up app.js. And I'm actually just going to command A and command V and just you know, paste all this stuff in here and then walk us through what we're doing. 
So again, we're importing another component from uh, the Apollo library, and this is Apollo provider. And then we're importing the client that we just created in the last step. And then what we want to do here is we want to wrap our switch component in this Apollo provider component and pass in the client. And so what that's doing is that's going to allow us to use uh, the use query hook, which is a React hook for Apollo, anywhere in our component tree so that we can do our data fetching sort of at, at, at a component level that makes sense for our application instead of like trying to pass it in and do a bunch of prop drilling stuff. Um, so, okay, cool. So we'll go ahead and save all that stuff. And really nothing should have changed. Like if we click through our application, everything's still the same because we haven't wired anything up yet. So if you scroll on down, we're, we're on step two now. Um, and so what we're going to do is query for data on the home page. And so I'm going to open up our pages directory and go to homepage.js and see what that looks like. And really we see that homepage.js just implements this post list component. Um, so it looks like our data fetching is probably in there. So let's open up components and go to post list. And here we can see that what we're doing for this test data is actually just pulling it from this dummy data folder, right? So we've got um, some data in here that's JSON that's shaped exactly like the response that we're going to get back from WP GraphQL so that we don't need to do a bunch of massaging. Um, but what I'm going to do here, so let's go ahead and I'll do the same thing. Um, I'm just going to check our time. All right, so we've got, yeah, you know, we've got about 25 minutes left. So cool. So we're 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 making good progress here. Let's see what we get. So I got a syntax error somewhere. Did I crash the browser? Well, that that's my fault. I pasted that in the wrong file. That makes total sense. Um, so let's come back in here. Not app.js. So this is good. All right, and then we're going to come back in here and we want to open up that post list component. Right, and then, yep, copy and paste this stuff in here. It looks like this is angry at me. So let me give this just a refresh real quick. Let me make sure what we got. So we got post list in here. All right, app.js looks like we want. All right, so let me refresh and maybe maybe we crash code sandbox, y'all. I didn't really run through that scenario in my head. So let's all cross our fingers. All right, loading posts, sweet. Okay, I'm not sure I could have stand like handled. I'm, I'm a high confidence guy, but not a sick fail, live fail in front of 600, 600 thoughtful developers, uh, confident guy. So cool. All right, so let's hop back into post list because that's where we we're at. And so we got exactly what we wanted, right? When we copied and pasted that, that content into here. Now this is pulling from my, LAR, from my uh, regular WordPress site. All that stuff is good. And so let's walk through what we're doing here. So first we're importing these two lines from Apollo, right? We're importing this GQL helper and this use query hook. And then down here, we're actually defining our query. So right, we define this constant variable called get all posts. We use our GQL helper to uh, format that, which is you know, definitely recommended. Um, and what we'll do here too, to sort of just show you how this workflow works with graphical. So I can just take that query, paste it over here. And then as long as everything's formatted right, I click run, I get the data. So it's really nice workflow between the two. Um, and then we can see down here in our post list component, uh, instead of querying for our dummy data, we actually implement this use query hook, right? And we pass it in our query. And then we destructure these variables from its response. So we get a loading error and data uh, properties that we can then use in our code, right? So if it's loading, we're show that loading post message we saw when I was sweating just a second ago. If there's an error, right, we're gonna return an error. And then if we get back our posts, we're just gonna map through them and display them using uh, this post card component. Okay, so cool. So that's working um, pretty much, pretty much uh, the way that we expect it to. So let's, Click in here. Oh man, so if we try and get more details about artists and airplant chicharrones, that doesn't give us what we expect. Um, so we actually need to update that page as well to sort of look at our dynamic route parameter and get us just that post that we want. Um, so I'm gonna scooch on down in our repo to step three. And then really the modifications that we're going to make here are to, um, we're gonna open up pages and go to post page. And so let's just copy this and we'll paste it in there and then we'll, we'll talk through it like we've been doing already and give that a save. Let's make sure it works first. 
All right, cool. So right there, we're getting back all of our data that we want um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and, and talk through this, right? So here we're doing something similar, but different, right? So we're importing those same packages that we did in the last step. We're defining another query, uh, but this query is a little bit different in the fact that it takes in a variable, right? So this operation get post by slug, which is a query, we're gonna pass it in this ID variable. And then we're gonna use that ID variable to query by slug. And GraphQL has a number of different ID types. Slug is one of them, database ID is another. And then I think there's also just ID, which is a unique ID that WP GraphQL gives to every sort of node. Um, so here we're getting all this stuff and we're telling it to get all these different categories and our post resources and stuff like that. And then we're, we're actually implementing this uh, very similar to we did on the last step, right? So we're using the use query hook, we're passing in our actual query string, but then this takes a second argument. And this is going to be an object. And then we're gonna pass in, you know, we can have different properties in this object and variables is one of them, right? So we're gonna tell it, all right, we're making this query that we know uses a variable and somehow we need to pass that data from our route, which is, you know, slash blog slash artisan air plant chicharrones into this component so that it can sort of make the connection and fetch the right post. Um, and so we do that using the props that get passed uh, via this route component, right? So when a path matches this pattern, blogs slash, you know, something, uh, it's going to render that component and pass some props into it. Um, and from those props, we get this match property, which, you know, is basically any of the matches for those route segments. And we look at the params and, and the slug. And it's like this because really we could have, you know, more complex dynamic route segments. So maybe we have slash slug, I don't know, slash colon revision or something. So there could be two params that we're getting out of there. And that's sort of how all of that stuff works together. Uh, but then we use that and we pass that into our variables uh, property here. And then that gets sent off to WP GraphQL to, to render that content. So everything's looking great, but if we sl scroll down, we really don't see our ACF resources. So we're gonna need to take one more step to make the, that data visible because we know it's already there, right? We're already getting this data back um, from WP GraphQL. So the last thing that we need to do is uh, show some ACF fields in the post page content. So I'm going to open up uh, this post page content. And we'll do, do the same deal here, right? We're just going to copy and paste, and then I'll walk you through what we changed. Um, so let's go ahead and save this out. And the first thing that we needed to do, right, we're destructuring a bunch of these variables from the post that gets passed into this component. So we need to add post resources to that. So we pull it out of posts. Then we're going to create these two Boolean helpers down here, have resource posts and have resource videos so that we can use them in our React code to help us determine whether or not we want to render particular components, right? And so if we look how, at how this is handled with categories, we have this have categories helper and this ternary uh, where, you know, if we have categories, then we're going to render whatever's inside of this. Um, and you know, map through the categories list and display all of that stuff. So that's basically what we're doing here, right? So we've got our, own, we, we open our own ternary and we say, all right, does this have resource posts or resource videos? And let's make sure this is actually displaying and cool. Yep. So if you're interested in getting some chicharrones recipes, Fran helped uh, hook us up with a bunch of that stuff. Um, so, right. So we're saying if we have posts or videos, then I want you to render the rest of this markup. And here we're going to render, you know, build on our CSS that already exists and have another categories last list div, add an H2. And then for this URL of this unordered list, we're going to loop through each one of those resources, right? So if we have resource posts, then map through all the post resources and the blog posts uh, and render a particular link that looks like that. And same deal with the have resource videos. If we have those, we're going to render those there. Um, so cool. So that pretty much ends our like live coding spa demo. We've got about 15 minutes left. So what I'm going to do now is sort of sh shift gears a little bit, right? So we finished our project. Now, how do we get this live um, out of code sandbox and on the web? And so that's where our Atlas platform comes in. Um, and so if you pop out to uh, the GitHub repo, and scroll down to the deploy step, right? So there's a branch here for that's particularly made for deployment because we've got a spa, right? It's just an index.html file. Um, so we need to do some stuff. And if you want to check out Atlas, click this link um, and this will sort of give you like 
the overview page of what's up. Um, we, we offer something called a free sandbox account to all developers. So if you want to just sign up just to play around with this, this technology, this link will direct you di directly into that sign up flow. You've got to, it asks for a credit card for fraud reasons, but I promise you, you, you won't get charged if you go through this flow. Um, and so what we need to do uh, to make this application available on a node container is add some additional layer of server, right? This could be HTTP server. Uh, in this example, I just followed the guide for create React app to, to deploy it with Express, right? And so if you were using something like Next.js, Nux.js, FeltKit, where it's a full stack framework, a lot of this would be unnecessary and you could just deploy your project, right? We're only doing this because we're building a spa. It's just an HTML file. So we need to uh, make sure that that gets in there. So definitely check out Atlas, um, sign up for a sandbox account, deploy, uh, and I'll sort of show you how that would work, right? So I'm here in my Atlas account um, and I can go ahead and click create app. And this is where a lot of those, you know, really helpful developer workflows come into play. All of this stuff is integrated with GitHub. So if I select pull from my own repo, um, I can click in here and I've already authenticated with GitHub. So it's not going to ask me to do that again. But if you were going through this for the first time, you would definitely need to. Then I'm just going to select a repository I'm going to select our first headless project. And then I'm going to go ahead and click continue. Um, and we get to choose where we want to deploy this at. And I'm going to select continue. And then I'm going to select a branch. And for this, I'm going to select deploy, right? Because that's the only thing that's set up right now with Express. And then for me, I'm going to select that I already have my WordPress instance because I do. Um, but for you, if you're going through this for the first time, you would probably want to create your own WordPress environment. And it's worth mentioning that clicking this button does not actually make the connection between the two. That is made somewhere in your code. Right, And so here, that's in my lib.apollojs file, where I point my code at the right WordPress URL. What this does on the Atlas side is it gives you uh, some UI affordances, right? So an Atlas app is kind of considered these two things and helps you manage those resources. So if you need to look at your node server or your WP you know, admin, like you can do both of those things as long as they're associated. Um, and yes, we do, we do host the front end too. No, that, that is... Atlas is all in one thing. So you're going to get node hosting and you're going to get WordPress hosting all in one package. Um, so when we talk about an Atlas app, that's what that means is one, one front end site, one, one back end site. So I'm going to click create app and then I'm going to uh, let that spin for a second because uh, that's all we need to do, right? So just a couple steps. Uh, and then that's going to build for, for just a moment. Um, and I'll pop back into my presentation because I got just a couple more uh, call outs that I want to make uh, and just things I want to point your attention to. So definitely sign up for an Atlas account. It's free to try. If you're interested in headless, this is the easiest way. We also have blueprints. So like if you want to one click deploy and just mess around with something uh, based on next in our, our framework Faust, like you can do that and deploy it to GitHub and then play around from there. Uh, but if you're interested in any of the stuff that we talked about and want to learn more, there are some links to our developer relations website over here where we've got tons of tutorial content focused entirely on headless. Uh, we've got an amazing YouTube channel that is uh, populated with videos, both from headless and our traditional developer relations folks. So lots of great content here if you're interested in WordPress. And then we've also built this headless WordPress developer roadmap, uh, which is a tool that basically starts from ground zero and walks you through all of the concepts that I've gone through today at a much higher level of detail. So if you want something that's like going to get you started, but take you one level deeper, that's the way to go. And I know we mentioned the Discord already, but if you click this link, uh, it'll spin you up an invite to Discord. We've got about 700 developers in there right now, pushing 800. So we'd love to have you in there. Uh, there's lots of great discussion, conversation about this stuff. And we tend to share lots of information about products and webinars and stuff with that community first. Um, so cool. What's the cost? I believe it's like 40-ish bucks for a month. So you can go to that Atlas. This first link uh, right there will, will let you know. But the sandbox accounts are free. So the sandbox accounts cost zero. Uh, sure. If you want a paid plan, I think the, the lowest tiered one may be like 40, 45 bucks a month or something like that. Sure. Yeah. Um, Cool. Yeah. So I think Fran, what, what questions we got? Yeah, there man? was a couple of uh, repeating questions in chat, but the first one I wanted to ask you, cause I'm not really well versed on um, Gutenberg blocks. All I've heard is Jason Ball said several times that there's no server side registry <laughs> for Gutenberg, but can you give us like a little bit, just quick high level, how it might work with Gutenberg blocks? 
Yeah, that's a good question. That's a question we get asked a lot. So I think technically there is a server side registry now, but it's not necessarily yeah. a requirement that blocks okay. opt into it. Like I think you could still build a block plugin on your own and have it be all JavaScript. But I do know that the requirement to be featured in the block directory now I think requires you to have like a block.json file so that you're discoverable. So okay. I think there's some movement uh, towards a bunch of that stuff. And uh, we internally know that that's a huge pain point for developers. So I know that a couple of different teams are working uh, on a plugin right now to help simplify that. And there are a couple of different ways that people have approached it. There's a number of community plugins out there. Uh, maybe we can send some links or you know throw them up on Twitter later to plugins that are in the works that'll let you do that, right? I can get back structured block data as JSON. Um, there's one for the REST API uh, that Roy Boy's done. Um, there's one, I'm not sure how many of these are still supported or in what phase of development. Um, I know we're internally pretty focused on launching, maybe not launching, but having something, getting feedback from the community on our solution in Q1 on an internal plugin. Um, and there are a couple of articles on our developer relations website. Um, if you scroll down here and kind of got to dig back a little bit into the backlog, uh, Kellen actually did two different posts on this. So there's like headless graph Q, WP GraphQL and Gutenberg, and then rendering blocks as HTML, uh, which is a strategy that a lot of people use as well, where they'll get back the HTML, run that through React HTML parser, and then use that structured data to. Oh, you know, that's right. Do, yep. do React components. So there's two methodologies. There's the parse the, parse the HTML, uh, mostly on the front end side, or you know you got a bunch of attempts over here to do more structured stuff um, with uh, Gutenberg data in GraphQL or the REST API. Now support isn't perfect. Like I said, these are all community sponsored things. Um, and like I said, I don't know, you know, I don't know what WordPress cores they're they're really. I don't think they're going to make a ton of uh, effort to you know fix whatever needs to be fixed on that end. Although the server side registry, I believe there's been some movement around that. Um, okay. Um, cool. And the other thing just I wanted to address too, and Jason stated several times with a WP GraphQL smart cache plugin. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. we understand right now so from a um, caching layer, it supports Varnish, which is WP Engine's cache layer. Um, if you want support for other cache layers and other hosts, and it's not in the documentation of WP GraphQL Smart Cache, please, please, please request us a, um, just make a request so that we can extend its um, compatibility with other hosts, because that's what Jason's mission is to do it with the, um, with a plugin. So, yep. Yeah, so somebody, and then somebody asked again, yeah, I think ACF blocks would have the same problem that regular Gutenberg blocks do. Um, and I'm not as informed on that particular uh, like style of architecture. And I think most of the problem is like, does it have a block.json file? And if it does, and it specifies all of its properties right there, we can get most of the data back in a structured way. Um, but that wasn't always the case. And when Gutenberg was launched, it was purely like, there was no server side awareness of blocks. So like getting that with an API and one of the examples in Kellen's posts uh, worked around that, right? Like I had to load up all of this stuff in an iframe and, and save a different representation of it. Um, and I might not be getting the details of, the, of that one right, um, but that's the essence of it, right? Is when it started, there was no server-side awareness. It was all just JavaScript that got loaded into Gutenberg. And then Gutenberg saved that content as HTML already, right? Um, and yeah, with the cache layer, WP GraphQL, it, not supported. And I will say there are features that are of that plugin that are supported everywhere, right? It's got object caching, I think, built in that should probably work in most places. That's going to make uh, stuff a little bit faster, right? That's not varnish, but I believe that would still sort of speed up some of your sites. Um, structuring data, yeah. Will there be webinars for ACF? Yep, we've actually got one going on, I think, tomorrow with uh, one of our other developer advocates. Um, Damon, who's going to talk about building block, uh, accordion block. Contact. Gravity so, so form. Yeah, con headless. Contact forms. And somebody asked some, yeah, some questions about plugins. Um, we've got a list of headless plugins right here that tend to work well with headless yeah. WordPress. Um, and so pretty much what you're looking for there is API support in some way. Um, and so if you, you want to use the REST API, like Gravity Forms has a great REST API. They also have a WP GraphQL extension 
that would add that data to, to um, WP GraphQL as well. I think same with contact form seven, maybe REST API endpoint. And there might also be a GraphQL extension for that. And so let's I'm gonna open up there. And I think, yep, if you come to extensions, this will give you like, if you wanna use WP GraphQL, right? This is the place to go to look for your plugins. Um, and then, what was I gonna say? Yep. Nope, lost my thought, but okay. Cool, other questions? Jeff, the, there was one um, interesting question on a couple of the downsides of using um, Headless. One of the answers I put was like, yeah, you will need a dev team savvy in JavaScript, that's for sure. Um, and then obviously the content, the marketer, the content editors workflow, especially I think, you know, with the way we've set things up at WP Engine, it's not that disrupted, but they will be, they will need to be, if they're not super tech savvy, they're going to be need to have an enablement piece on, Hey, this is what we've done. And this is what you're going to need to do to post preview and stuff like that. And, um, whatnot. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely more complexity involved, right? And that's why I yeah. call that architectural diagram out there because yep. there is, right? And so you want to, and when you're doing stuff for your clients, you always want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And so uh, for lots of small business websites, you know, the brochure site, this doesn't really make sense. It's, I think it's a lot of it is larger right. orgs. Um, although like, you know, I think hobbyist devs like myself, I'm going to move my own site to headless in the yeah. spring. So if you want to watch me do that live, uh, you can, like, I think it's a great, place to play around with new technology um, and stuff like that. But some other reasons not to use it. Like obviously we see that the plugin landscape can get a little bit more complicated. A lot of people have mentioned previews. So I'm actually gonna bring in something else, uh, which is, you know, and, and at WP Engine, we're aware of all these limitations, right? And so we're working really hard to create uh, software solutions to these problems. And Faust is one of the things that does that. I didn't wanna get into that because I really wanted to give people this code sandbox experience. But Faust is a framework built for headless WordPress, right? It's based on Next.js. Um, it is a combination of this Next.js front end and a WordPress plugin on the back end that facilitate a bunch of those things for you, right? So the previews, if you install the plugin, install the front end, like the previews work out of the box exactly the way you expect. When the content publisher clicks preview, it opens the front end site, authenticates, and then renders your preview on your front end app. So like that problem solved, what we're looking at and then developer relations team is how do we take the patterns that Faust is creating in Next and echo those out across all of the different frameworks that everybody wants to use. So me and uh, a guy named Theo, who's a dev on the Faust team are looking at like Astro, for example, as the first one, like how could we do post previews in Astro and take this same pattern again, right? Because there's not, there's, there's some special sauce that Next is doing, but it's not doesn't mean it couldn't be replicated elsewhere. So that's kind of the next step for this. Definitely check out Faust if you haven't. If you deploy a blueprint, which if I go back to Atlas, and I guess it's about time. Oh yeah, yes, let's, yes. let's do this. Yep, because our thing's live, right? And so I'm going to click our link here, um, and we'll load this deal up. And cool, we see that that all you know works as we'd expect live. Um, but if I went to Atlas again and like create app, start with a blueprint, you will get a Faust-based blueprint. So like, if you want to play around with that, definitely that would be my, my starting point for a lot of this. If you feel like you can handle that level of complexity of JavaScript, right? So I, I intentionally geared this toward, you know, like a simpler, I guess, project like code base, just because I wanted everything to be a little bit more isolated. Yep. Authentication is something that, um, Faust it handles as well. Um, so it does that with the post previews. And then there are also, I think, methods in the works right now to do that for other, other reasons as well. Like you can make a whole uh, SaaS app. Kellen, who's our manager, you know, definitely like talk with him about it. He was working at a company where they built a whole, you know, giant SaaS company on headless WordPress yep. using uh, gravity forms, authentication, all that stuff. Um, yep. Jeff, do you have yeah, time for, for more? Do you have one time for, yeah. I, I, just... I mean, I, I don't have anywhere else to be okay. <laughs> and we still got 500 people up in here. So I'll, I'll kind of hang out for- There was a question from, yeah, in. there was one question, um, I think it was from Sonia. How do you do um, advanced custom fields headless for pages and not for post? Um, I think that would be the same way, same right? Thing, right? I think yeah. we would just, yeah. yeah, come back in here and we can, we can take, you know, I, 
I'm not positive. So let's do a page resource thing if everybody's cool with it. Okay, let's try. Um, yeah. Let's mess around and find out. <laughs> so for nested pages, and what do you mean uh, nested pages, Scott? Uh, for that, we tend to lean into WordPress's URI structure. <clears throat> um, and this is uh, definitely getting out of, out of bounds here on what I think we might be able to <laughs> dig into. But Faust will sort of support that, right? As you create nested pages, it'll change the URI of the page to match the nesting. Um, and that's what Faust does. It's like, we, we don't use slugs. We use URIs and then you've got all your nested pages. And so it should just kind of resolve. And I would take a look at Faust and how they handle that. Um, so we do this page resource. All right, you know, we're gonna show this. Settings, location rules. If page is equal to, all right, yeah, we'll just do that. Um, this is cool. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I shouldn't have gone off the cuff here. If we can do you don't have to render it. Just, yeah. Yeah. Let's just see if we can pull the GraphQL data. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm just like, to, this is, yeah. Let's do this top level page. I don't know. And let's save changes. Yeah. And we can get back to you on this particular one. But I feel like now I should be able to kind of come in here. Uh, all my pages, it says it was updated, right? We've got page resource. Yeah. I said show in WP GraphQL. That should be good. All right. Uh, cool. So if we come down into GraphQL, let's leave. Does that camel case automate? Yeah, it probably does. Huh. I feel like if we do, let's see, do we get? Do we get it? Let's see. Page, Page resources. Or... Yeah, it shows up. Yeah. Woo. So. Yep. Um, yeah, I guess absolutely. if I were to pass in the ID for that and it yeah. actually had it, that would, you know, it just adds it in the same, same fashion there. Oh. Um, yep. I mean, we're working on, yep. And I think that's just the problem. Like lots of people said, asking uh, when spell mm -hmm. kit, when view, when Nuxt. And so it's just, you know, we, we've got to sort of go one by one because all of those frameworks are a little bit different and they're changing all the time. So we've got to essentially take those patterns that the Faust team is exploring for us and like re-implement those. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, um, you know, is there WPML support? Uh, yeah, I believe there is. We had somebody in there who's using it. Fran also wrote a, I think there's an extension for that, right? Yeah, there's a, a GraphQL, WP GraphQL extension for WPML. And then I use the Polyline plugin, but mine was a free, it was the free tier and it was just a demo just to show people with Next.js yeah. internationalization. Yep. And here you we could, go. WP yeah. GraphQL ML, WP Polylang. Yep. And check out Fran's tutorial on that, which is back on our website, because that was a really cool, cool sort of exploration of oh, um, thanks, yeah. using, use, yeah, man, using the internationalization. Thanks, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. What other questions we got? I know we're sort of wrapping up. Um, yeah. In the, and you click view page, what's, what that happens? Is. So if you have the Faust plugin in there, it will redirect you to your front end site and render it. Awesome. Um, good question. <laughs> it is awesome. Yeah. So th just a couple other call outs I'll make about Atlas. It's like, I know we sort of just glossed over this, um, but there are awesome features built into this thing as well, that if you're looking at like Netlify or Vercel, uh, we have. So let's hop in here and I'll sort of show a couple of those while people are still hanging out. Um, and so a couple of different things, like here we can see, you know, here are all the builds that we've had. If we want to rebuild, we can do that. If I were to actually open up and make another commit to this GitHub repo, to the branch that is deployed here, it is going to automatically rebuild my website, my front end, right? So all I got to do is push to Git, boom, this thing rebuilds for me. And so it's such a nice developer workflow. Um, if you want to rebuild your site if like, say if the WordPress content changes and you want to rebuild, we can come over here into settings and create an environment webhook and then hook that up to any number of webhook plugins in the WordPress admin so that when you update a post or a page, it pings this webhook and tells Atlas to rebuild your site so that if you want your content editors to be able to have control over rebuilding something, you can do that. And that rebuilds your site, clears out the CDN. Um, and then we also have this feature called preview environments, which are PR previews. And so like, for example, if I was out here and like, uh, you know, Fran was like, oh, cool. I like Jeff's thing, but I'm going to submit a PR because he messed up this, this other thing. He can open a PR to this branch. And once that PR is open 
and I've got this feature turned on, obviously, click on, um, it will create a, an environment specific to that PR preview. And then that whole thing is managed by the PR lifecycle. So if I close the PR or merge it, the PR environment goes away. If, Fran, if I request changes from Fran in the PR and he submits additional, you know, like code, he does another push, it'll rebuild that PR preview environment. So this has been like, yeah. you know, we're just trying to, trying to catch up to where the rest of the JavaScript hosting world is at. And we're getting really, really close y'all. Um, great. Netlify. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good question. How can you post back to WordPress with GraphQL and headless? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's called, uh, mutations. Um, yep. And so, yes, you can, you can, uh, for some of that stuff, you need to be authenticated though. So that's just kind of a, a thing to think about just depending on what you're trying to mutate, uh, and, and what that thing's rules are like comments. If you try to push in a comment mutation, that's fine. Cause it expects that to be open. Um, but if I were to try and modify a post, like it applies the same capability checks to the resources. GraphQL, WP GraphQL applies the same capability checks to all the resources in there that, um, you know, you would in regular WordPress, right? It's not letting anybody come in and overwrite post content. Same with the REST API. So th those are work very similar. Um, cool. Yep. Headless local. Yeah. What other questions? There was a question cool. about uh, multiple editors modifying content at the same time, how that all works. Uh, this, I think it's the same way that it would work in WordPress. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, they're in there doing their thing. The post page gets locked if somebody's already editing it. Yep. Um, you might just want to watch your web hooks then. And like, yeah. <laughs> if you had it, if they were saving, like you could just Jeff and I rebuild your site. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's something we're looking at too, is like finding some more granular recommendations on web plugins, but multiple authors in the back end should work the same as it does in WordPress. That kind of would be cool, Jeff, if there was a webhook plugin that would set permissions on certain content editor. I don't know if that exists, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yep. Atlas search in there. Yep. Another search-based plugin that we're working on. Yep, use ISR. Um, you don't, yep. What is the major exactly. difference between Atlas and normal WordPress instance? So, I mean, really, uh, in a way, nothing, right? I mean, this this Atlas, when I come here and I look at like my thing, um, you know, I've got this linked WordPress environment. That is just a WordPress environment like all of the other WordPress environments that we host. Um, it's just only used as an API. Now, if you install Faust, it'll do some other stuff like, prevent those, you know, like it'll prevent the theme pages from displaying, do a lot of redirects for you. So if somebody tries to go to a URL on your WordPress site, it'll redirect them to your front end site. Um, so there's a lot of helpful like niceties with the Faust plugin. Yeah, and also that's a good call out for that Jason just said, you know, I mentioned webhooks a lot. And if you do things like ISR or, you know, different revalidation schemes based on your framework. Yep. Um, you can, you can, yep, you don't need webhooks, use ISR and then you don't need them, which is true. Is WP Engine headless? Um, or both uh, no. and headless, I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the website is not headless. Um, I've used Algolia. Yes, we've checked that out. It is actually powering our documentation search for the Atlas platform. Um, and it's really cool. So, Oh, where am I going? Back here. Yep. So if you come down here and you scroll down, you'll get to the docs for like Atlas itself. And we're using Algolia search right there. How is it possible to pre-build? That is based on whatever your framework does, right? So like I've got, let me see, I'll show y'all an Astro example, uh, which is a oh. static site generator. You, you would um, use Astro. Jim. Of course. I'm, 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 Astro, I'm, I'm, I'm I gotta use yeah. Astro now. So I've got this Astro WordPress starter. <laughs> Um, and this is all pre-built, right? So like the way that this works is when, when you, when you do a, like a deployment, right? It, it's going to run through several steps. So it's going to run NPM install first, then it's going to look for an NPM build pat like script and run whatever that is. And then NPM start. And then once it's done building, it's going to run NPM start. So for you, you can configure that however you want. Right. And so um, my Astro example is a, is a total static site, right? There's, it's already sucked all the data out here. It's just a bunch of HTML pages in a build directory. And so for me, um, 
let me go open that. I'll sort of show you. It's kind of like what I did here a little bit, um, but let's pop back to my GitHub. And and y'all who are people who are helping me run this event, feel free to stop me at any time. Like I'm, I'm jazzed that there's still 300 people in here talking to me. Um, so I will talk until my voice goes out. Um, all right, so if I open up this, let me see, package.json file, right? We're gonna build, build. It's gonna run this build command, which is astro build. And that's gonna suck out all my data, pre-generate all of my resources, create this disk directory for me. And then my start command is instead of like next start or something like that, since this doesn't have a server, I had to install HTTP server and then just point it at the disk directory. So since our Atlas platform is just uh, is like node container hosting, it's really up to you how you want to stiff, stitch this stuff together. Um, how do you do headless non-pattern pages like landing pages? Where does that come from? So we see, actually, we see a lot of people use ACF for that. Um, and like, so if I go out to like Gatsby, uh, sorry, like, well, let's do Gatsby WordPress. Um, Gatsby WordPress homepage. Uh, this has got a good example of that. And they actually use ACF here or ACF oh, Pro to like build out a whole homepage structure, exactly what that con like that question asked. I think it might actually be an options page. I'm not, I'm not sure. I need to refresh myself, but basically that's what they did, right? You have all these different places where you can put in your, your different CTAs and what's the icon and what's the link. Um, so we see a lot of that stuff happen with ACF. Please. Yeah, heading out. Thanks all. Yep. With a. Okay. Um, any idea if mutations are going to be implemented at some point? This is a great call out. And yeah, let me pass this along to the team. Um, so right now this says with ACF plugin for WP GraphQL, not supporting writing to fields. It feels a bit weird to have to fetch data and GraphQL and post it in REST. Any idea if mutations are going to be implemented at some point in time? Uh, I don't know if that's on the roadmap, but I'm definitely going to take that comment and give it to uh, that particular team so that they can they can uh, check that out. Because yeah, that should that sounds like it would be helpful. Yep. How does it know what URLs to look for? Um, well, Elrond, I think that depends on your framework. Like with Astro, um, I pre-provide it a list of all the possible URIs. So like if I look at my code here um, and I go to source, I think pages, and then I've just got this URI one. I've got this get static paths that gets me all of the different page URIs in my WordPress database. And then it pre-builds all those pages. So I've got to tell it what to build. Um, yeah, great, great to have people here. I think that's, yeah. Okay, yeah, and Jason's got some more details about the ACF mutations, and it looks like we're waiting on something to go into GraphQL nice. uh, and, and bubble down. My flexible content return in the right order. I, I believe so, yes. I believe yeah. it respects the order. It respects that it's the order, in. yeah. Um, yeah, Jason, yeah, Jason Ball, such a wealth of information. He absolutely is. Yep. We've got some types yeah, here. Time, yeah. Every time I do a one-on-one -on -one with Jason Ball, I always- So learn. that's a great question. Uh, well, if you, if the content is dynamic, then Elrond, I don't think we can pre-build it, but if it's so like server-side rendering, it's oh, going to yeah. do something similar to what we did in the spa, right? Where we've got this route segment that populates data and then on the fly, it's gonna go and get that data from your server and then bring it back and, and build it. Chat GPT is actually powered by Jason Ball. Yep, and it's Jason Ball's birthday, everybody. So wish it him is happy his birthday. birthday. So let's embarrass him. Happy birthday, Jason. Yep. <laughs> yeah, any more burning questions? So going once, going twice. If not, there will be a recording of this um, and we'll send you Yep, pre-build dynamic pages. Yeah, and, and that's what I'm saying. You can pre-supply them with get static paths or something. Um, but awesome folks, man. Th thanks yeah. everybody. Still 250. Wow. There was uh, one last question, I think. <laughs> uh, okay. Can users be authenticated with this approach? Uh, th they can, yes. And there are a number of ways uh, that you can do that depending on what you want to do. And I feel like I, I repeat saying that. So like, 
I, since I'm over here on the WP GraphQL one, yep, there's WP GraphQL, JSON web token authentication. I think there's yep. like, we've got an application passwords example. Um, yep. And Jason's in here too, right? So like, I, is there a basic auth one, Jason, if you wanted to do that, even though it would be unadvised. Um, and then Faust as well, ha the plugin facilitates OAuth and OAuth flow. So that's kind of what we're looking at. How do we make that pattern repeatable with other frameworks? Where right now it's kind of just built into so Faust. Doesn't that like, do redirect and local based or something, Jeff? Right? Or on yeah, the off? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, two, okay. And, and if you go out to the legacy docs, there's more details on the previous version there. So, like docs, guides, authentication. This isn't how it works in the newer version, yep. but these two strategies are the same. Yeah. Um, so, redirect based authentication and local based, That's based right. authentication. And that's what we're looking at. Like, how do we how do we make patterns that people can implement easily in whatever framework? Um, are we getting email? If you want them, Anders, like we were so happy that so many people showed up. Yeah. Um, cool. So pr probably, especially if they're related to ACF. And so like, if you want more content and more notification, follow us on Twitter at WPE underscore builders yep. or uh, the discord like is a great place or just one of us because we all post about it. Um, but we'll probably only share ACF related stuff with that ACF lift serve because we don't want to um, abuse it or whatever. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, who, who knew, man? Wow. This yeah. is this is fantastic. Y'all have made my week. Thank you so much for this. You had no idea we were doing this. That's awesome. That's <laughs> exactly what we're here for. We're spreading the good word about headless WordPress and thank you all for your feedback. Uh, anything that was useful, we're definitely going to comb through the chat scran, tran, chat transcript, transcript and pass any of those like relevant details along to the product teams that are working on that stuff. So you telling us what you want to be able to do really helps us, one, produce content, and two, improve the products that we're already working on to make Headless WordPress better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My last call out to you all is definitely go grab you a free Atlas Sandbox account Yes. Before uh, the flash sale is over and it goes up to zero point zero zero dollars um, <laughs> in the next couple of months. Always free. Um, so yeah, definitely always free. Yep. <laughs> if you want to pay it, like the developer plan, very affordable. I mean, that's but our Christmas gift. Get in there, gift. start mucking around. Yeah, that's our Christmas gift to Give you. Give to y'all. How long is the sandbox for? I don't know. I don't think there's a limit. There's um, no limit. It doesn't. Yeah, matter. as far as yeah. I know, there isn't a limit. Um, yeah, and maybe maybe. We've got to shut it off, but I mean, now nah, we're trying to teach people 1,000 of it is still, yes, 1,000 times zero is still zero. Still zero. Yep. Yep. All right. But cool. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, all right. Later days. We'll, we'll follow up with an email to you with a bunch of this stuff and give you the recording. Um, links to everything we walked through. And again, just so much gratitude to the community. Thanks for making this just a fantastic webinar. Thanks, y'all. Stay stoked. Happy coding. Thank you.